So uh, my name is Adam Taylor. Um, I've been involved in international archery since about 2016. Um, we got involved in Ireland in the World Field Championships, and that was my first taste of how archery interacts with corporate world in, in a professional level. Um, my professional background in terms of uh, marketing was I ran a 24-hour 2CV race and uh, I used to uh, be a motor racing person myself. So I'm aware of sponsorship and sport very well. And in my own personal life, I work uh, in a sales and marketing company. So I understand what brands are looking for in terms of their activations, their, their success rate, what they're actually needing from an event. It's not just a name on something. It has to have real world you know, results. Today, we're going to be talking about partnerships and how we can link corporate world and archery events, be them really, really small to international global events and everything in between. If there are 10, uh, 10 people coming for an archery competition locally or 100 people coming internationally, the same process is involved. It starts with a blank Excel sheet of paper and you have to work out, first of all, every single expense you can possibly have. Where most people fall down is where they start looking at the income streams. The majority of income streams are just archer entry fees, full stop. And that seems to be it. There might be a small barbecue that might raise some little bit of money or a raffle as well. But there is an awful lot of other revenue streams that are missed. And if your event is a once off, you have to think of that way in terms of the sponsor you're getting. But if it's a multi year one, that's a much better one because you can entice sponsors in in year one where all your costs are low and capitalize on their income down the road. And you can offer them packages, which will not just be for a once off, but a year or two or three year plan. So that works quite well. And some clubs really just want to have ones that will grow interest in the sport. So it has very little to do about generating money. It has very little to do about rankings around the world, but it has to be about how do we get more archers into a competition, which again is something completely different than if you're trying to run an event to make money. So you have to be aware of goodie bags, what archers actually want, you know, and what is missed in absolutely everything and an awful lot of events from small, medium to large is the feedback. You have to, when the event is over, that is the most critical time. You have to capture information about what the archers felt and wanted and what was missed. And in terms from a corporate point of view as well, did the sponsorship have an impact on the brand? Did people, are, are they aware of the brand more afterwards? Or do they feel what most brands use these days is a metric called brand love? Like, is there now more love for that brand before the event than after the event? So we'll talk about that in greater detail as we go on. The events have huge connotations. Uh, local clubs have a, a kind of a drive to build membership base. Uh, that's their primary goal. The second one is, of course, is to get people to come back to the competition. And it's also the biggest problem that we're having, particularly in Ireland, is due to our weather being fantastic, is we're trying to get people who are used to shooting 18 metres in the clubhouse to actually go outside into the field or into the target archery world. So we're trying to encourage people in and out. So the goal of a competition is very different, is how do you attract the people who are warm and cuddly inside out to the cold, harsh weather and show them the excitement of that. And that goes with the same type of um, goals of if you're trying to make money, if you're trying to make this a, a multi-year event, or is it just a once-off? And um, the biggest problem that people have is they do an event and they that's it, it's finished with. They never think about the following year or signing people up or asking people would they come back? And if not, why wouldn't they come back? And then building up an event around that feedback. So the objective events are very different depending on the club's goals, the association's goals, or the federation goals. So, um, and then there's also different looks from an archer's point of view. Some they want to qualify for certain competitions. Some they want to get scores. Uh, some they want to qualify for a team, or they just want to have fun. They're all very, very different. And understanding what those are are very important for when you're building this event. Um, I've been fortunate enough to look at events for qualification for Team Ireland. So that was a very small shoot, five targets and just the Irish team there trying to qualify. We've also run uh, the World Field Championship in 2016, and that was to show off Ireland as a tourist destination mainly. So we got a lot of input from the Irish government and um, particularly the Kilruddery Estate because they wanted to be seen as a destination, per, a destination venue. Um, you've got small clubs who are there to raise money. Uh, they need to have income streams. Uh, there's some clubs that want to just have, you know, to be known as 
a good competition for local archers. So their competitions are based on fun and family day outs. So there's come and tries and there's barbecues. Very different than if you're coming over to get scores, you know, where you want to run multiple competitions in a day. Um, so you need to be, when you're planning all your events, be aware that there are very, very different views and what your view might be different than what everyone else on your committee's view is. So it's good to have a talk around to actually go, what is the objective of this event? The reason why it's important to know the objective of your event is you can match to the different type of brands that you want to attract into. So if it's a qualifying event, you can go in and go, these archers are the potential future Olympians. Whereas if you're like, this is a small club event where it's just got local archers, you're like, we will have 100 people from the area who will be buying in this local butcher shop. It's a very different kettle of fish to talk about. If you're hosting a big, you know, exa extravagant events so like the youth championships, it, everything's going to be magical and amazing and look at this amazing venue and it's a very different corporate feel and professionalism where compared to a small club event, which would be let's have a barbecue and a big family day out. It's a, it's a much more slower and, you know, casual event. And that's a different type of branding that you would get. The, a funky, young, fresh brand might be more interested in the small local one whereas your more corporate blue chip brand might be more interested in the corporate event kind of side of thing of a youth championship. So the majority of uh, sponsorship, it, it used to be, and, and to use the, you know, the motor racing analogy, put a sticker on the car and you know, they win and you'd sell more of that thing on a Monday. So win on Sunday, sell on Monday used to be the old sponsorship adage. It's now much more a package deal where what exactly is the sponsor getting is not necessarily, you know, sales in the door. And then also from your point of view, the event manager, it might not be hard cash that you're getting. It might be getting a variety of different things like discounted products or, for example, discounted uh, restaurant meals which would be great because you want to offer that to the archers because they want to have a much better experience when deciding to go to an event. They're going to go to your one because they're getting looked after more. They're getting more experience from it. So sometimes like what we've done in the past is we've gone and got discounted for local restaurants. So when the archers come to a weekend event, they're going out on a Saturday night and they're going to that restaurant and they're going, geez, instead of paying 20 euros, only paying a tenner. So this now event feels like they've saved money and they've got more experience. So what you've done is that next year you have more people coming. So it's not necessarily hardcore cash is always the objective. 90% of the time, yes, it is because it's, but you have to be aware there are other angles for other things, you know, and that is the trick. You, you have to understand that for a sponsor to write a blank check and go, there you go. Thanks very much. Here's my logo. Never see you again. That ship sailed many years ago and that's not how things are done anymore. If, if I have an event in Dublin and I'm competing against someone who's running an event in Cork, why an archer would go to you know one or the other so i need to make my event more magical more memorable more entertaining and fit for purpose so if they're chasing scores yeah they need to have lots of competitions but if there's also an element of they're meeting more of their friends they're getting more value for money they're experiencing something that they would not experience so if you're a small local club and all of a sudden you're getting well, a discounted in a restaurant, you're getting a goodie bag, you're getting, you know, you know, a free T-shirt. And you're like, oh, hang on, this is actually more valuable for me to go to this event, you know. So and you can tie in sponsors for all those line items without having to pay a single penny for them. Oddly enough, I'm, I'm looking at an event right now and it's very much the case of number of archers coming in will only generate X much. But if I want them to come back next year, I need to go, well, what are they actually getting for their money? And therefore, I'm like, well, I need to add in more to make this more appealing. If I'm trying to convince someone to get on a five hour flight to come over to my competition in my country, be it for a, a club shoot, a national shoot or an international one, I have to give them a damn good reason to get on a plane. And, you know, that has to be creating, you know, packages or, you know, items that they go, God, that's what I like about that competition. I'm meeting people. I'm going to do this. I'm getting a value for money. And when I'm talking to a, a corporate backer, I'm explaining this to them. I'm saying, listen, I want you to be, if I'm doing a national one or sorry, an international event and I go, oh, I want you to be the coffee sponsor of the day, you know, so I just want lots of free coffee. And they go, OK, that's great. We can easily do that. And all of a sudden you're coming in and you're going to I get my free coffee throughout my competition. So there's more of an experience. Oh, you can't afford to ignore anything like this, because if you just operate this 
I have X many archers with X much, you know, uh, entry fee. That's all you have to operate. You can never, your, your event will tick over slowly and it will never grow. And in fact, it will probably over time lose archers because they're like, what well, I'm losing out, I'll go to somewhere else where they're offering me more, you know. And particularly as well when it comes to volunteers as well, you're no longer offering them perks like cheap discounts in restaurants or coffees or whatever the gimmicks that you are, you come up with the volunteers are not going to get involved because they're going to see the numbers dwindling. So it becomes harder and harder to run competitions. So packages or sorry, corporate links in the local community are as important as if you're talking to a big blue chip company compared to your local supermarket down the road. They're the same process. You've got to engage with them and people start getting connected and then people will be wanting to help you run events in the future. Uh, in the current climate now, it's more important now than ever before from a a brand's point of view to be seen to be out there because if half of your sales and marketing of your business has now disappeared your marketing is now pretty much extensionally just digital which means they used to be able to do activations in a supermarket or an event or so if you were going getting off a train there might have been someone there handing you a product or a sample or if you're in a supermarket they're like try this that kind of very like one-to-one -one marketing has long stopped. So people aren't seeing the brand as much. And particularly with digital TV, they're not watching adverts anymore. Yeah, and they're skipping the stuff on the phone. So, phone. so you need to have more of an interaction with people in places where they feel safe and loved. So at a sporting event, if they go, oh, this brand got involved in this, or this local shop got involved in this, they're like, I'm going to support my th these people who are supporting us. So there's much more of a community-based uh, connection with people and, and brands. Oh, the opportunity is massive because brands want to get their name out there. They want to get their new product that they've been working on that's been shelved for three months. They want to get their brand out there. They want to get their culture out there. And particularly with brands, they, they have a, very, a lot of different metrics which they measure success on. And one... It's, yes, there are sales, but there is another thing that people don't know about, which is the brand love. So they do research on like, do people love their brand, know their brand, engage with their brand? So there's an element of being at these competitions, these community events, you're going to have, you know, people go, yes, I trust and love this brand because they got involved with us at a difficult time as well. So there's huge connection. Now is the most critical time to be thinking about this because all the brands are starting to think, what can we do? What's available? Like they have budgets and they have, you know, ideas and they want to be seen by people, but they don't know what's going on. Events are being canceled. Events are being opened up. No one's really sure. So now is the time to start the conversation with them and say, listen, there might be an event in six months, two months, three months, but are you interested in talking to us? And brands will be like, yes, let us know what it is. How many people are going? What do you need from us? And they, they much prefer to know that there's a two-way street. But say, look, if you are sponsoring us through product or financial ways, we can help, you know, give morale back to your workers who are now in the office. We can go and do come and tries in your office to get people experiencing archery. And then there's an element of everyone's starting to feel a little bit normal now. But these are the conversations that need to happen now because this is going to take six months, three months, four months to get back to the swing of normality, you know. So we need to start the conversations today. This is a visualization technique that I do for any archery event, any corporate event or any music event that I've been involved in over the number of years. I will sit in a room and I'll close my eyes and I'll go, OK, experience the event through the eyes of a participant, be it an archer, be it a concert goer. What happens? Like, how do they arrive? Are they getting a plane, train, bus, car? What's the first moment they are, is a touch point with you when they arrive? So are they getting off a plane? Are they met by someone at the airport? You know, is there when they're when they're driving into a venue, is there an arrow that points where to go? Like, what is the first interaction? And then that's the moment your brand really comes alive. All the emails and all the social media, but that's where they first interact. If you've just got a little target and you've handwritten an arrow that way, the instant feeling is, cheap small event but if you've gone and got a little tiny one that's produced a cost of fiber in a local printing company they're like oh there's a little professionalism going here even a subconscious it adds to the overall experience and every event that you are doing be it a five person must get scores for international shoot or uh, come and try for a lot of kids up to your international stuff that is all you know a brand a living entity itself so you have to create that if you want this to be a once-off or an ongoing thing you have to live by these core values so 
So that's what I do. I normally do a visualization technique where I kind of imagine myself walking through the competition and seeing everything that happens. And I'm like, well, where do I go for food? You know, how long is the queue for food? What type of food is it? And you kind of work through that. Um, another thing is like, I kind of also sit down either with the committee, again, if, the, if you have a committee to run an event, so I kind of go, what are the core values of this event? I know it sounds very marketing, very wishy-washy, but if you can come up with four words that signify this brand, this event, then every question that you have about that event will be answered by one of those four words. So like one core word that I love to use is, is solid, which basically means it's dependable, it's there, it's solid. So everything has to be strong and rigid and there's none of this kind of like wishy-washiness. So that might be one or like, Another one I've used for other events would be, let's say, focus. So that's a core value. So everything we do is laser sharp focused. And it's basically focusing on the objective, focusing on the goal. So we have to be aware of all of these things. But I think if you, if you have yourself four core values, that helps define your event and create your event, you know, and gives that, that kind of brand feel that you want to have. Um, there was an example I would use for a question that when, when we do these type of workshops to come up with these type of names or these type of things, um, a question like, what type of shop are you? Again, I know it's lovely marketing speak, but it's like, if you, are you like an Apple shop? So you're glass everywhere, wood, minimalistic stuff, or are you more like your local B&Q with lots of things going on? It's all little, little stuff. So again, if you translate that to an archery event, you can have a very minimalistic kind of super futuristic event where it's all tv screens and scoring and all that kind of stuff or is it more just your local uh, farmer's market type thing with little stalls about everything and it's very kind of like everyone can talk to everybody and it's all very casual and relaxed and that comes down to the type of uniforms that your volunteers wear are they wearing high-vis vests branded t-shirts branded trousers or just you know them just over there because that's them standing over there so it, it builds every touch point is a certain type of thing that builds on that brand. So if you fast forward this 10 years, 12 years, you now have gone from a small club running a small event that kept to these kind of rigid rules and grew this to this brand. And that's how you see certain events around the world that are events you want to go to. You know, there's a certain indoor event somewhere that you, oh, I love going to that one because it's crazy. And it's great. It's wonderful. It's lots of flashing lights. It's fantastic. Or I really like going to this indoor one over here because it's rigid and strict and I get lots of my shooting done and I know I'm finished at that certain time and I like that. So again, it's, it's identifying that type of thing and growing your event. Every event starts with 20 people or five people turning up to it and then they grow to hundreds of people if that's what your objective was. I've been to many international events now and I've seen the good, the bad and the ugly. And some of my favorite shoots have been really small local ones because they're just good fun and they're not, they're not trying to pretend to be something they're not. They know they've only got space for five targets. So that's going to be whatever, five people to 20 people max. And that's, they're happy doing that shoot. And it is fantastic. Everyone goes down there. We all shoot. And then we have a bit of lunch. We shoot again. We all go home. And it's fantastic. And everyone has fun. And it's a very relaxed atmosphere. But they're not trying to be the next international event. They're not trying to have lasers and smoke machines and stuff like that. They're just like, hey, guys. There's a nice weather today. Do you want to come down and shoot? And genuinely, that was the more popular shoots in Ireland. Um, whereas, you know, we've been to ones that tr over try to be something that they're not. And it just turns into a, not a mess, that's the wrong terminology, but just a lost message gets happening. You, you're very much like, oh, there's so much going on. It's like, I'm just here to shoot. That's all I want to do. And sometimes an awful lot with a lot of the international shoots, uh, the biggest complaint I would hear, not we'd always hear ones about the food or the transport, but they're, every event about the world but sometimes like i wish i could shoot more at this you know and even though they've got through the head-to-heads they've done a couple of matches it's a very long drawn out shoot process where it can be condensed you know um and, and people just need to be aware that you have to be you have to be okay with shooting a small competition if that's what you guys want to do that is absolutely fine in fact we need more of those competitions because that's where the sport grows so in terms of, um, again, the small competition uh, that I'm talking about, um, he, the gentleman who runs it is very, very good. He goes to his local butcher shop and he gets little, you know, hamburgers and hot dogs and there's a small barbecue. You know, we each give him a five or four and, you know, you know th that covers his cost and he gets the meat for free because everyone gets an email saying this event to you is bought to you by XYZ Butchers. And all of a sudden, you know, everyone's having a lot more fun and a lot more of experience 
at something that didn't cost anybody anything. And the club is, in fact, making a little bit more money than it would for doing this extra little bit of you know, background work. So what I do with my visualization technique is I will look at every touch point an archer has with the event itself. And I will look at, well, what packages can be created? So if the archer needs water or coffee or is there a water or coffee supplier in the local area or in the, the national supplier or whatever, can they get involved in somehow, be it, do you want to pay for the naming rights of all the water in this venue is going to be XYZ water brand? Or will it, I just need lots of free coffee to give all the archers free, you know, free wake me up juice as it is called sometimes. So the question is, you can create packages based on that. So the, the, I often see people go, oh, we'll come up with three tier packages of gold, silver and platinum. And they go off and they send this mail shot out to every brand around the country they can think of. And they get zero responses because they haven't asked the question, what does the brand get from this? And there's, you know, brands don't really care about their name on a billboard and being seen by 100 people or 200 people or 2000 people for a week. They want to know well, what, what experience does that person have with the brand? So if you can say, look, you're going to become the naming rights for the water for the area. The, every arch will have branded water bottles. They'll have your logo everywhere. And we'll be naming a target or two after you. And then the most important thing is it's it's I'm sorry, I want to make sure I'm not jumping too far ahead, but the, there's the the most important thing is to remember it's not just the initial contact that's important, then there's the actual activation, which is your event and how you tie in that brand. And quite often you will if you have a very big international event, or if again if you're small, you do need to have one person who is aware. I have commitments to brands here. So if you've got a local butcher sponsoring you and you've said, I will put your name on the bottom of the target, I will put your name on an email, I'll make sure that everyone's getting the, the hamburgers in branded paper or whatever it might be that you've done on a local level. But even if you've got a, a blue chip brand who you've said you're going to get this much sponsorship, X, Y, and Z, you have to make sure that you're actually achieving those targets. The common thing I see what people do is they'll go off and get a local sponsor to give them 100 euros and they say, oh, yeah, we'll put your uh, name up there on the bottom of the target. And that never happens because they forget or someone doesn't bother getting it printed or they get it printed and it never gets put on the target. You have to. It's almost a job in itself to make sure that the sponsors are happy, you know, that they are looked after, that you are achieving what you promised you will achieve for them. Um, but then the problem is after the event, when the event is over, there's the follow up with the sponsors. You need to be able to prove to them that, the objectives were met, that there was an increase in either brand love or sales. And then there's also the goodwill that you have to stay with them. So what I would do, particularly in the motor racing side of things, was we would take very, very high quality, good photos of their brand in whatever way the car was going around the corner. And that was framed up and given back to the brand after the event saying, thank you very much. And there was communication kept with them over the year for then next year. It was a lot easier to do this. So what we've done here in Ireland for a lot of these smaller events that we've run is we've invited the head of the supermarket down to bring his family down. And we've had a wonderful archery day with them. And then next year they're like, oh, geez, yeah, what do you need? It wasn't it wasn't a question of like, would you mind? It was more like, hey, can we get involved again? Because they experienced it and they liked it. So you have to be aware that there is a pre-event, the event itself, and then there's the after event. And those are three very big jobs. And if you don't do any one of those ones, you're going to find it very, very hard to get any type of corporate engagement throughout the years. Majority of sponsorship at a small club level comes from friends and family. You'll definitely get them once, but getting them twice or three times is very hard. So you need to give them a reason for it. And a thank you letter, a thank you picture, a thank you video, something for their social media is very important. So again, we go back to the local supermarket. They or strive for content on their social media aspect stuff. So pictures, videos, clips, anything that has people interacting or liking their brand, they will put up. Again, that has a benefit again of pushing more people into archery as well. So if there is, it's all mutual handholding effectively. So if I can give you a very nice video for your local butcher shop, you're going to put it on your social media and then people will see that and go, oh, that was very good of the butcher to sponsor that. But also, oh yeah, archery, I, don't, I didn't know it was available in my area. I'll go and try it. So there's huge benefit, but the follow through is super important. And that's often overlooked. When you're creating your sponsorship packages, you are looking at what type of people you want involved. And that could be anything from 
your small local community to your blue chip companies, but there's often the overlooked ones, which are the government partnerships as well. Everyone has their own brand. So you've got your local county council, which has the Dundrum Council brand, where they have a very different want and need compared to the Irish brand or Brand Ireland, which is, again, a very different international brand that they're trying to achieve as well. So every type of person that you deal with, be it, again, your local supplier for cups, your your international supplier for target stands or whatever it is, they all have a brand. They all have experiences, wants and desires. And you have to try and marry that to your event. If you are a small event that has five targets or 20 people turning up, you're not going to have international tourism companies dealing with you. Whereas if you are an international event where you've got lots of people coming in, you can have airlines that do want to talk to you. So it's again, it's, it's marrying the want and the need of that entity that you are talking to to make sure that you're not over promising, you're not under delivering, you've got to be very realistic with what you can achieve. So again, if you are a small target shoot, you can talk to small brands. As, a, as, a, as an event grows, the type of brands or entities that it attracts are different as well. The mistake that we all fall into is that as we grow, we no longer talk, we stop talking to our local small brands or events or government agencies, and we start talking to archery companies and just trying to get archery brand sponsorship. Whereas there are lots of brands, there are lots of corporate governments, there are lots of entities that want to get involved with small companies. One of the best branding experience that my old company used to do was not you know, big flashy things, but we actually sponsored a local small football team for a couple of hundred euros. We got the name on the jersey, but the brand love that we got in the local community was fantastic. Again, so it's identifying that as you grow, there are massive, there, the vast majority of businesses and entities in the world are small to medium size. There, we need to stop always looking at the big blue chip ones, but as your grow, as your event grows, you can talk to vast more majority of people it's almost better being a medium-sized event than an international large event because you have much more scope of people that can interact if you're too big you're you can't you're too big for a lot of brands if you're too small you kind of can work with an awful lot of them as well so there's we i love talking to local brands that are cookie making companies drink companies there are loads of those ones that want to be seen to be sponsoring a professional event to be able to go look at what we can do because they really want to be seen as the big boys out there, but they can't go and sponsor a, you know, a motor racing event or an international event, but they want to be seen to be involved. And if they can go, we are involved in this national event that is bringing in a hundred or 200 people from around the country, happy days, you know, and that's, they can put that all over social media and suddenly becomes valuable to them. You know, there's quite often, you know, like I remember the, the world uh, championships in Holland. I was amazing to see Red Bull were there, you know, and that was fantastic because all of a sudden I was like, yes, there it is possible to get other brands that are not archery related to them. And I think that's been lost. And that is something I'm working on. And we're working on now for all for the events here in Ireland where we're planning for 2023. We've worked out there are five events between now and then. And we are targeting corporate companies or corporate brands that are nothing to do with archery because we understand that this is an untapped market for those brands and those government agencies and those local communities. They've never talked to archers, whereas we as archers have never talked to them either. So it's a fantastic opportunity and there's huge scope for it as well. And the brands all love this. And the conversations I've been having with, with brands of, again, these are, you know, 50 people office type things are not like multinational ones, but they want, they would love us to come down and show archery to the staff, you know, explain what's going on and bite them down to a competition. And they're feeling so much more involved. And they're like, oh, well, oh, this is growing. This is huge. We can get in on the ground floor at these events. So they think they're getting value for money. They love to be involved. And now we're now suddenly getting, we're not necessarily looking for huge money. We're looking for more level. Actually, look, you, you, you're an actual printing company. We, we need to make this look spectacular. So can we, instead of getting cheap print, can we get high quality print and like flags and things like that? So that now is going to make the event look much more professional, which then makes us easier to attract to other brands to go look at this professional event that we now have. 
maybe we should now be talking about naming the brand after or the event after your brand. And it's a different conversation, but you can't just go, I have a blank field. I'm going to go talk to, you know, whoever is on the stock exchange today and, you know, expect them to no longer sponsor a motor racing event and move across. We need to give them a reason to come across. Um, there is lots and lots of, particularly in this COVID world that we're in, there's so much more that we can actually get conversations going because people are like, they're starved for content. They're starved for avenues. They all want to be clever and what's the next thing. So we, we, we've got a huge opportunity in our hands here, but we need to grasp it instead of just going, uh, I'll talk to the other sponsor, the other, sorry, you know, archery event companies and see what we can do. So we, we need to start all thinking a little bit outside the box. You cannot rely on income streams from archery manufacturers. There are only so many of them and they only have so much money to give to so many events. And so we need to find extra ways of bringing in more money into the sport. It's the only way it's going to grow. If you keep talking to, if everyone in the world is talking to the same 100 people, those 100 people are going to go, we can't talk to all of you. So it's going to be super limited and you're not going to have much success. So don't waste your time talking to these guys. Go talk to brands that have never been talked to before. You've got to, again, we go back to my visualization techniques and you look at ways that brands, governments, local people can get involved and you create those packages. You look at those, as we've talked about before, finding out what those, those entities want and then seeing, well, can I fill that want and can I connect it? So, for example, like we would look at, there's a, a, like a sports recovery center down the road from one of our venues. And I'm like, well, I have 100 athletes that are going to be very stiff after a weekend. So I have 100 athletes that might want to use your service. I tell you what, can you give me a discounted rate for my athletes to go in? It costs you nothing. And then I'm now offering this package saying, guys, after your event, there is a, a sports recovery center available to you at a discounted rate for going to this competition. All of a sudden, the archers are feeling like they're getting something. The uh, local business is now getting new customers. And the next year, when I go back to them, I can say, listen, we're now having a bigger event. I think you might want to actually be on site. Do you want to be on site? Do you have a kind of a, we can, we can rent you space in a pop-up tent. It'll only cost X much. So it's a different conversation. And now they're willing to bring in money and to bring in expertise. And again, the event has now grown because you now have on-site sports recovery systems. And even if it's just people talking and getting information, those people know that those archers will come back in three weeks, four weeks, that shoulder is still niggling at them. So there is huge scope for everything. And again, that's not an archery company that I talk to. It's something different. So it's creating packages and knowing full well that I'm not going to be able to get someone to write a check for 2.2 million for an event without any justification. We need to be able to understand what they want and then do I have that want that can solve it? And then can I create a package around it? And I don't know what their situation is like, particularly after COVID. Do they have a lot of money for marketing or no money for marketing? And you have to kind of tease that out with different packages, you know. So I would always go in with the kind of a, again, a higher kind of package. And as I'm talking to them, it's very important. If you just email in and say goodbye, good luck to them, it's very hard. But if you can get face to face with them, you can see where they kind of fall. Is it too expensive? Or they look like, oh, that seems a little bit too cheap for them, you know, which is a conversation you can have with people as well. So you need to be aware of just to be able to tailor each package for the brand or entity or government body. And that is the one thing that annoys me about people who wouldn't say, I'm in charge of getting sponsorship or I'm going to go off. They go off and create a package, be it two or three of them, and just send it out to everybody. And that's like, that's, it's, it's kind of like, as I would say, well, it's, using, it's like having one chat up line and hoping it works all the time. It's not. You need to be able to tailor for the person that you're talking to. So you need to have a package, again, for that local sports shop. You need to go, well, look, this is the type of athletes that are going to be here. You can now talk to them about this. Or if you're like an ice cream person, well, this is how many kids are going to be here. It's a different conversation. So you need to be able to, spend time get a template package but that you can edit it and change it to be specific for the person you are sending it to and that's the key thing make it personal make it relatable to them and don't just go oh we have this many people coming to it join give us cash that's never going to work people often get scared that it is a huge job itself going out and spending hours and hours and hours trying to find people talk to people 
again, if you're running a small competition, we're talking maybe an hour a week max. You know, if you're doing an international one, it might be a couple of days work. It's identifying who you want to talk to and actually what brands you want to be involved with and then talking to them. And quite often, 90% of the time, you're going to get told no very fast. That's great, you know. And, and it, you do need to have a mindset that you are asking people to get involved in stuff that they might have no interest in. So you will get a majority of no's and you have to be okay with that, you know, and you have to understand that if you get 10 no's, it just means that you're one no away from a yes, if you keep going. So you can't just go, well, I've got three no's today and that was kind of more mortifyingly horrible. I'm never doing that again. You have to understand that you just didn't connect with them for whatever reason. And quite often what I find is when people say no to me, I might come back to them and say, quick question, why did you say no? And they might go, well, actually, you know, because X, Y, and Z, you'd be like, okay, cool, thanks for that. And then next year I come back to them and I've answered those three questions, you know, and I found out what they were like, what was missing and I put that in. So I look at every conversation at every prospect that I ever have as information gathering. Don't look at it as a sales pitch. Find out, well, what information can I get from these people that I can then improve my service or product for something else down the road or with someone else or fantastically, if they say, well, actually, you don't fit our brand because of X, Y, and Z, you'd be like, thank you very much, change my pitch, and then talk to their competitor with that answer down, and all of a sudden, there's much more of a connection there straight away. So I've learned. It's always, always, always learning. So prospecting shouldn't be a horrible job. It shouldn't be tedious. It shouldn't be long. It is an, it's an adventure. You've got to find avenues and ways of talking to people, creative ways, and you've got to find create finding the right person is often the biggest challenge but once you do making sure you actually ask them the right questions and that's important so building a successful partnership is it's like building any type of relationship there's a lot of groundwork there's a lot of talking to a lot of people and then it kind of just happens and it clicks and then of course it's like with again with like all relationships you don't just go i've got the person and then forget about them you've got to nurture that relationship you've got to put effort into it so again it doesn't matter if you are a small event or an international event you have to treat these people with respect and you have to give them what they are actually looking for as well. So again, make sure whatever you're doing at your event that you do not forget about your corporate sponsors or your government bodies or your local people. You, if you've promised them certain things, make sure you deliver on those things, you know. And again, it's that kind of connection of invite them down, make them experience the actual event itself. A lot of people go, thanks for your money, bye, and then you never see them again. It's like, listen, thanks for your money. Come down and have a look at it. Let me show you your brand. Here, can you be there to hand out the medals at the end? You know, little things like this make them feel like um, this is their event. This is their thing. And look at all what everyone's experiencing their product or service. And it's a very important thing to have that. Because when you go back next year, they might not, they might have no budget for it, but they might be able to put you in the direction of someone that they like that say, look, you should be involved in this. So it's all networking. It's all building together. And it's all... It's all basically, if everyone's having fun and everyone's enjoying it and everyone's getting what they want out of it, it's really easy, you know. But if you have forgotten to put their logo where you said you would or forgot to have their, you know, didn't have their products on display correctly, you know, it's very important that you just be aware of that. You have to build a loving long-term relationship with these people. And one of the, the cheesiest lines that I always use is, I don't want to just take your money and run. I'd rather work with you for five years, 10 years and grow a long term relationship. And that's what brands want. They don't want a one day event where they're never going to hear from you again. They want to know, well, even if you're only running a one day event, but you, the person, you, the club, you, the association, I liked working with you. I would like to work with you in the future. I think this is a good fit. So I could have uh, an event or a brand you know, be involved on one type of competition but they're also involved in another type of competition, because, but they're getting two different things from these two different events. But it's, you're looking for partners that aren't over asking as well. That's the other, the mistake that some events will make or some brands or, or event companies will make is they go, I'm getting some money from this person. I'm going to give them absolute, I'm going to over deliver, which is great. But then there's over, over delivering and then them expecting that at all times. And you'd be like, well, look, I'm actually giving you a value here. I need to be, you know, reciprocated in some way. So there are some brands that will go, I tell you what, I'll give you a free product. And then they list the requirements that you have to do for all of that. And at some point you're like, it's just quicker and easier if I just go and buy it in the shop and then just give it out for free. You know, it's for, if all those hoops I have to jump through, it's not going to work. So that's very rare, 
but just be aware that they are out there and there are brands that will promise the world, but they're only going to give you a small discount on a product. And you're like, well, it's not worth for all the stuff that I'm giving you and all those things I'm jumping through. That's not a good connection. You know, you want to feel like they're getting value for money and you're getting value for money as well. It's super important that you learn to say no as well, because as your event migrates from a small event to a medium event to a large event, the person who is giving you 100 euros for the title sponsorship can't give you 100 euros for the title sponsorship as you're now a medium event, because that's going to be that's a 10,000 euro sponsorship event. So you have to say thank you very much. But no, you can no longer be the title sponsor, because if you just kept them as the title sponsor the right way through, you couldn't afford to run the event anymore. So you have to have the ability to break up with brands and events and, and, and corporations as well. But do it in a professional way that you can go, look, you can't be the title sponsor anymore, but you can be the sponsor of X or Y. Create something for them so you're not just going goodbye, you know. So just to be aware of that. And, and the example I would always give and when I'm doing these things as well is uh, look at every Formula One race. You see sponsors on cars that are all over the car and they move to another team and they're, a quarter of the size. They can't expect the same thing everywhere. You know, that's very important to know. When people hear sponsorship activations, they think big, complicated, confusing things. You guys already do this. Like the raffle that you all do at events, that's an activation itself. So as long as you're talking to a brand and going, how can we create something magical and memorable at an event? You can sit there and go, let's create X, Y, and Z. People will engage with it differently. And people remember it. And all people want is photos. They want people engaging with it. They want people smiling and experiencing their brand at your event. So it's it's very important to be thinking outside the box. You know, and once your event starts to get some traction, a lot more archers are going and people are coming to visit and see it. Then you can start having, you know, these activations, which could be the raffle, but on you know, mass amounts of just kind of increasing at levels of complicatedness and just making it more fun and entertaining. So we can we can grow, you can grow any event. The best, one of the best activations we did for a brand here in Ireland was, believe it or not, was just simply deck chairs and bean bags because people were able to go from the event itself and sit in a chilled out area and experience the brand while drinking it, sitting on a bean bag and the kids were playing with Jenga very, very simple stuff, but the brand was like, oh my God, everyone's loving everything. This is a great and wonderful time. And you know it's you know it's success when the entity that you've partnered with are bringing people from their office down. If it's your local supermarket, if the people are coming in, if it's the big corporate company from down the road, if they're bringing their office workers down to experiencing your event, you have reached a level of partnership that you know will last. Because if you never see them at, if you never see them at an event, you're, you know you've got something wrong. If they're not going to come down and enjoy it, you've got to work on this. Thanks very much for listening to me ramble on. I hope that was some success for you guys. And any questions, just drop me a line.